You said something about asking me for inspiration, but you don't start with I'm uh, working in Amsterdam. We have this group called uh, Rabbit Vision and Astrobody Aesthetics in Amsterdam, Rasta. Uh, then we found it uh, around 10 years ago. It's a lot of fun. Refresh is at the heart of the Black Ball Initiative. Black Ball Initiative. John Franco is going to tell us how to learn uh, dark matter as a Black Ball Initiative. Black Ball I'm the last speaker of the court. 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 i and as I said, this uh, Black Hood Initiative is to put beyond the physical and social media and the story of science. Yeah. 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 Okay. Welcome uh, everyone. Uh, we just heard an uh, excellent uh, IDC colloquium uh, by Paran Jani. Where is Paran? Over there. And he will speak shortly and will tell us uh, something interesting about the moon that uh, perhaps uh, some of us haven't heard before. Um, we also have a visit uh, by uh, Gianfranco Bertone, uh, who can tell you anything you want to know that we don't know about the dark matter. <laughs> and uh, about the history of dark matter, he educated me this morning actually about that the history started before Fritz Zwicky uh, in 1934. So some of you who, who may not know that, other people talked about dark matter before that. And uh, Gianfranco knows everything about it. Um, and he's visiting um, the US uh, on a sabbatical from uh, Amsterdam, originally from Italy. <laughs> And in fact, uh, we met it at your birth uh, city. Exactly, my hometown yeah. indeed. And just a few months ago. So, um, so we have an uh, interesting uh, collection of talks today. We'll start with Karan Jani uh, from Vanderbilt. And he will talk about the moon as the next frontier for multi-messenger astrophysics. Um, and that includes gravitational waves. Uh, then we hear from uh, Jorge. Javier uh, Doble uh, from Vanderbilt, uh, where is Jorge? Yeah. Oh, over there. And then uh, he tell us uh, about the um, automatically labeled EUV and X-ray incident solar flare catalog using machine learning to refine canonical databases. So based on this title, the two of you are not related even though you are from the same <laughs> university. No. Yes. Um, and then um, uh, we hear from Vedante Chandra from here, uh, okay, um, uh, who will tell us about the three-phase evolution of the Milky Way. And finally, from Gianfranco, I highly recommend everyone to stay until the end. Um, Gianfranco will tell us about gravitational wave probes of dark matter. So go ahead. Well, thank you, Ali, and the organizers for inviting me to speak about uh, about one of the new frontiers that my lab has taken and the community of gravitational waves has taken, is to think about a gravitational wave detector on the surface of the moon. Now, the last, one of the times which I remember I was speaking from this podium, a uh, few years ago, that time, a Indian lunar lander, the Chandrayaan-2, was supposed to land in the next few hours uh, during that day. Um, unfortunately, it crash-landed uh, when, when it happened. 
And so it's a coincidence that today there is another lunar lander which is supposed to be landing at around 5 o'clock uh, central time. Uh, this is the first private company's uh, lunar soft landing that is going to take place. This is the intuitive machine. This is the IM-1. Um, those who are surprised to see the logo of Columbia Jackets there, well, welcome to the private space exploration. Um, this is the first US soft landing that will be happening in the 21st century. Right? So it's a pretty milestone moment if, if, this, if this works out. Now, since from 2019 uh, till today, there have been three successful landers, lunar landers that have made it to the moon. The farthest you see is the Chang'e 5 mission from China. Uh, the middle one is the Chandrayaan 3 mission from India. And the latest one is the SLIM mission from Japan, which landed upside down. So it's the, it's, it's the antennas are down and the, the whole thing is you know, the legs are up there. But you could see these are actual pictures. There is actual landers on the surface of the moon in a way that has not happened since the Apollo era. Also, last time when I was here, the only known gravitational wave discoveries that were published was this first row of events. So this is every gravitational wave event, all the 90 discoveries that we have had so far. Um, these are the spectrograms. So this is what actually LIGO measures. Uh, and from there, we try to analyze what the source is. All the plots that we see, O3 written, which is the second row and all the way to the down, is we have made discoveries after 2019. Now from then uh, till now, um, currently the fourth observing run of LIGO Virgo Kagra is going on. Those who are the enthusiastic followers of our live alerts that we send out to public to tell which parts in the sky to look at whenever a gravitational wave is measured by LIGO. Uh, you have seen that there are a number of events, alerts that you have got so far just in the first half, which is the O4A, uh, is roughly the same amount as the total number of gravitational wave events we have seen all in the past nine years combined. By the time we are in the commissioning break, when we restart for the rest of the runs, you would also see the same number of gravitational wave events. By the time in 2025, we will publish all of our results to the public, which would include things which are not low latency alerts, but also something deeply buried in the, in the data, you would have roughly about 300 gravitational wave to 400 gravitational wave events. Right? The field literally went from one to 400 just in this matter of the last, last few years. But one thing that was gonna most likely remain fixed in the last, since then last time I was here in 2019 till now, is that we have seen only one multi-messenger event, which is our famous uh, binary neutron star merger, GW170817, happened on August 20, 17, 2017. Um, the graphic here shows the, on the left side is the solutions to Einstein's equation when the two neutron stars are merging. So you can see the gravitational waves being emitted on the right is what happens to the matter. Uh, this are our simulations at the back at the times when we announce the discovery of, uh, of the binary neutron star event. I'll make a bold claim here that from this one discovery, you know, which had this huge promise of multi-messenger astrophysics, it has faded. And that is a result on the fact that we have not seen many such events. And I don't expect that we would be seeing more than a handful of such binary neutron star events, not in the next few years, not in the next 10 years, I would argue that we have really no shot at seeing them up to 2040s or even beyond. The current gravitational wave detectors don't give us the kind of information we need to measure the binary neutron star sky localization. We have this space mission, LISA, that is flying in, but that's not really going to help at all in the kind of binary multi-messenger we can do with binary neutron star. And that all led to a lot of planning among the community, thinking about what the next generation detectors look like. An idea that has attracted several people from US and Europe is this observatory called LILA, which stands for Laser Interferometer Lunar Antenna. It's our proposed gravitational wave detector on the surface of the moon. Uh, one would argue why go to the surface of the moon and would be any different than where we are on the Earth. 
Well, the first part is that the moon has an extremely low seismic sensitivity, seismic noise. So, the frequencies that we cannot access on Earth from LIGO, which is on the, first, on the plot on the right you see, like at LIGO we about end at 10 hertz, the detector on the moon starts seeing 1 hertz, 0.1 hertz and above. The space mission LISA essentially ends at 0.1 hertz. So, this fills up the gap that you do not expect any other detectors to fill in. It's actually much cheaper to build a gravitational wave detector on the moon because the biggest cost of LIGO or any next generation detector, almost 70 to 80 percent, goes into building your vacuum chamber system. You need a 10 to the power 11 to minus 12 tor of ultra high vacuum. The natural vacuum on moon is better than what we have on Earth right now. So, you can think of this almost as three standalone landers like the ones that have already landed if they were communicating. We have the required infrastructure to make gravitational wave measurements. Um, we have a science case that is directed towards the binary neutron star. That is our flagship science. That is not the only science though. So, here is this gravitational wave spectrum, different detectors. On the further right is your pulsar timing. The furthest left is your LIGO like earth based detectors. Within this frequency band, as soon as we would have a gravitational wave detector, our biggest change for early warning for neutron stars, which in LIGO is in best case a minute, next generation detector can be best case few minutes to an hour maybe. The improvement is weak, weeks, months in certain case for the heads up for binary neutron star. The effective baseline for sky localization is your earth moon separation we would know a source within arc minute square when we would have a gravitational wave direct on the moon. And that, that does not discount the other amazing sources like the tidal disruption events are of white dwarfs around IMBHs, which you would never have access on Earth. The white dwarf mergers as progenitors of type 1A supernova and all that nice science around it. So, we are a growing community. Uh, we are starting to build a collaboration from scratch. We had submitted a proposal to NASA and the reviewer had this very nice line that a lunar gravitational wave observatory would leverage the tremendous resources currently being directed by NASA towards lunar exploration. Right? This is really a marriage of the two most exciting frontiers of 21st century, the gravitational wave and lunar exploration. Um, other than nice colleagues from all these universities, we have serious experimentalists from the LISA and the LIGO and the Virgo world who are involved with the technology demonstrations. We have NDAs with two major US space companies about how we are going to launch this, where we can launch this. A Pathfinder version, we are in discussion with the Indian Space Research Organization to have it launched within the next five years. That is at least my personal deadline. So, if you are interested, we absolutely would welcome your expertise. The vision, our strategy is to have this shown as a discovery class multi messenger mission by the time Astro 2030 decadal survey arrives. So, if you would like to chat more with me, I am around today and tomorrow. Thank you. Karan, um, obviously, um, the optics need to be very precise. Um, how difficult would it be for engineers or scientists to make sure that it does to the precision needed? Yeah. And, and I mean, there is dust and all kinds of yeah. No, it is, a, it is a challenge from which point we are to where we think about a full-fledged gravitational wave observatory. The challenge is far less extreme than something like what LISA mission would have faced in terms of showing its demonstration. We are thinking about a first a Pathfinder mission, which can be achieved in the scale of the next five years. The Pathfinder would have all the required technology demonstration we want to do. Or our central idea being that whether we can access this low frequency sensitivity with the suspension, whether the moon seismic noise, how it interacts with our gravitational wave detector. So this is a cartoon diagram of uh, of a actually a lander and a rover would be able to achieve what the Pathfinder would look like. And uh, in terms of the scale, though, you know we are roughly hoping so the Pathfinder can be achieved with the kind of landers that the Artemis is going to send by 2028. Uh, you know, with subsequent years, the Artemis planning gets more <coughs> complex. We would be relying on them. Hope is we are not going to the moon just to build a gravitational wave detector. Uh, we are going to piggyback on a, other engineering efforts. And you are optimistic during your career. I want this to happen by the time scale of LISA mission. 
because it's very critical that this has an overlap with the LISA during its four or five years that it operates. There's a huge variety of sources, especially to test general relativity, which would occur in LISA band for a few years and would come to this moon detector for a few days or weeks. And that really changes the way we think about GR tests. Uh, this is a very naive question. I'm surprised by the strength statement being and it might just be wrong, but my memory is that the dampening time of seismic activity on the moon is quite long. Like, it following an impact, it takes quite a long time for it to decay. Is that considered in this straight statement? Does that matter? It does matter if you are using the moon itself as a gravitational wave detector. So there is an alternate idea that if we look at the re if the incoming gravitational waves gets into resonance with the moon, which is an idea like a, a Weber's bar detector, but instead of bar detector, now you have the whole moon. That's where it does matter. You know, what are the sort of long form signals? In the frequency time scales that we are at, uh, our experts from lunar planetary has seismology have said that this is we are still at much higher frequencies. Is it really impacts or, or, or seismic noise within the moon? Because uh, what actually brought up is the effective impacts by asteroids. If there is an effective, so the, if the, let's say, moon quakes or micrometeorites, those would impact something around your millihertz gravitational wave measurements. There would be, there is always going to be non Gaussian noise like this, which we see in LIGO all the time. And we just correct for them at the time of occurrence. So non-stationary, non-Gaussian noise is the nature of our detector. Okay, more questions? Please. So this is an interesting concept, and just you know, building on Avi's question about the challenge for, to achieve the precision of, with, with autonomy. Yes. Without any sort of human-assisted yes. um, support. I wonder about an alternative concept where, where the, the lunar component of the detector would be passive maybe using one of your photometers or a custom photometer, have the active components on Earth, and then use laser ranging between the two. I think other people propose things like this too. So my question is, what about this whole class of concepts where the lunar component is passive? Yeah, I, no, it's a great, I mean, that was early sort of starting point. You know, the history of us thinking about gravitational wave on the moon really scales back to 1972 in the last Apollo mission when Weber had his, his, uh, his experiment there. And all this concept we thought about. Mm -hmm. This one relies exactly on how LIGO works, or LISA works. So we know from first principle all of our technologies, how the subsystem interacts. The lunar ranging and others are very interesting concepts. None of them are showing the promise of the sensitivity requirement that we would need to make a measurement. In this case, because we are using the subsystems that are well tested, well understood, the challenge here is, of course, the precision and autonomous measurement. I don't see that 10 years from the now that there would not be astronauts on the moon working around a base. Would you go with um, I would send graduate students. <laughs> <laughs> You don't have to pay the per G. <laughs> <laughs> Let's thank the <laughs>
Great. Um, so hello, everybody. My name is Jorge Padial. I'm a fifth year PhD student from Vanderbilt University. And I've been working for the past three years out of the University of Chicago Computer Science Department. And I'll be presenting today part of my thesis, uh, which is called the Alexis Solar Flare Catalog. Um, so let's go for it. Uh, so why should you care about space weather? Well, um, there's a lot of uh, trans tra transitory and um, energetic events that come out of the sun uh, have effects for planetary atmospheres. Um, some of these energetic particles can interact with satellites and interact and uh, disable GPS and um, cost trillions of dollars in infrastructure. So there has been a really big push to try to identify uh, models that are able to predict when and where uh, extreme space weather is gonna happen. Right? Um, but in order to be able to do these predictive models, we need really good data. So let's talk a little bit about the data that uh, we are using, um, or they're used for solar flare prediction. The first standard is the definition of a solar flare. Here we ask the F XRS sensor, which is basically a single pixel sensor. They define solar flares, that is the standard. Three monotonically increasing data points um, mark the start of a flare. The, mag the maximum magnitude reached is the peak of the flare, and then we have a consequent de decay phase. But nevertheless, this is a single pixel um, detector, and it doesn't really have location information. So for this, there was another instrument uh, built, which is called the Solar X-ray Imager. Um, and this is about 10 years worth of, of data from 2010 to 2020 that has barely been used. It's very difficult to use this data, um, but it was primarily built to, to kind of identify where these uh, transient events occur. The Alexis pipeline using computer vision was able to actually um, increase the metadata, uh, and now this data is available for, for use. Uh, we're able to actually identify the solar center and the solar border a little bit better, and now it could be included into the SunPi program. There's another telescope it's called SDO, which takes um, images in multiple ways wavelengths, high cadence, high resolution images across uh, different parts of the solar atmosphere um, in the EUV and it probes different temperatures, different ions, and different phenomena. The other database, uh, the other data that's there is the Helio Seismic Magnetic Imager. And there are two main data products that are important here. Right now you can see the colored regions. Those are active regions. So um, magnetically unstable regions, we're able to, tr uh, to detect them and track them. And also there's another data product where those boundary boxes that you see around, they calculate some magnetic field features. These magnetic, so the ML question is, can we use this magnetic field time series to be able to predict when and where a solar flare would occur? And the main assumption is that we know when solar flares happened. We know when and where they happened. But that assumption is actually kind of difficult to do, right? Um, so Alexis, my pipeline, takes uh, two different ways to kind of answer this question. One of the ways is changing the way that we standardize the definition of a solar flare. Instead of using these three monotonically increasing data points, I resample, I fit, and I take a derivative. This is called the differential analysis of the XRS signal. And here you're able, in, in the magenta, you're able to see that we flag two different regions that are, that are a particular solar flare. It is worth noting that under the current standard definition, only one flare would have been occurred here. And now we're not saying that these are flares, we're flagging possible events, right? Um, and so we have such good data. All these, uh, all this data is about 12 second resolution. That's, I mean, 12 second time cadence, which is really good. And so the question becomes, um, can we predict solar flares and forecast them like we do with the hurricanes, or are they unpredictable like lightning? You can see here the AIA pixel, the resolution that we have on the solar surface is about the size of um, Hurricane Maria who hit Puerto Rico in 2017. So this should be a great machine learning problem. We have a lot of data, it's very constrained, we understand what is happening, right? And the main, class, and the main ML problem is a classification problem. And nevertheless, when you go into, and you think about classification problems, these are two different, you place elements into different classes, and we think of it as discrete, but in practice, it's not really discrete, it's actually a continuous function where you set a threshold. And that threshold, anything above that threshold is cataloged as a flare, anything below that threshold is cataloged as, an, as not a flare. And there are many metrics in which you try to optimize these models, one of those metrics being uh, the true skill score. And the main, the best performing models that we have try to answer if an active region will have an M or an X class flare within the next 24 hours. But nevertheless, the TSS scores for these models, no matter how much data you put, no matter the models that you use, are lingering in around the 0.7%, which is not horrible, but why can't we do any better, right? So there are a couple of possible reasons for this. Hey, we've reached as far as possible that we can. Another reason might be um, that the data is labeled incorrectly or a combination of the above. And for my thesis, we went for the data is labeled incorrectly, right? Um, so the main takeaway from Alexis is that that mapping from where, where solar flares happen to the active regions when solar flares happening is kind of difficult and that's our main, our main assumption here. 
um, our main contribution here. So let's look a little bit at how we do this, right? So here's the data. We have seen this before. I've talked to this about that. We have the EUV data and the single pixel XRS data. And so we do a couple of unsupervised techniques to kind of cluster important regions that are, that, are, that are of interest, and we call those candidate flares. So in this example that we have here, we found one region, and we could take the integrator flux across time for this region. And we also find another region, and we could take the integrator flux across that region, right? And then the question becomes, what set of weights can I multiply each of these time series such that when I sum them together, I take the linear combination, I could get as close as possible to the X-ray flux. Um, so, and if we're, when we're able to do this, we can better map from where the flare happened to the active regions that produced them. And so these machine learning models will be able to correctly label which one of these active regions actually uh, uh, a magnetic reconnection event occurred. How do we do this? Well, we use a lasso, uh, um, in a convex optimization uh, using a lasso, and we're trying to predict the target signal. This is the target signal, the XRS data, which is labeled by Y hat. We also have a number of different um, regions that have been identified, which would be the matrix X. Um, in this example, we have two regions, the yellow region and the blue region, right? And what we try to do is figure out what are the weights, these beta, these beta vector. And for each of these weights across the regularization path um, given by lambda, which is the amount of penalty that we give this convex fit, right? This uh, linear fit. This lambda can go from, once we have that beta, we can take the dot product of the matrix and that will give us the black line, which is the linear combination. Now, this lambda goes from zero all the way to 10, right? Zero being practically a least squares model, 10 being a highly regularized function. And you can see as the lambda uh, increases, the, we can drive some of those coefficients to zero. So the question then becomes, can we use different metrics to try to answer which of these lambdas, lambdas is the best um, fit? Right? And some of these metrics are the Pearson correlation value, the root mean square error, the, uh, the mean square error, and also two values that we optimize for. One of the values takes into consideration the total energy of the system, and the other value uh, optimizes for the similarity between the two vectors. In total, what I'm presenting to you now is a search of 1,057 flares over 1,000 one-hour time ranges, more than 14 million convex fits, and 14 terabytes worth of data. Um, so let's look at some examples of this convex optimization. Again, we see the data that we already know. We have the active regions, we have the sun, we have the x-rays. And let's look at the players in, the, in, in this space. Who identifies the flares? First, we have NOAA, the Space Weather Prediction Center, and they identify here in red. The peak is the star, and then we have the flare duration in the, in the vertical, in the, sorry, horizontal span in red. And this flare duration encompasses multiple parts of what we, are, what we define as solar flare phases. We have the gradual phase, the impulsive phase, and the decline phase. We also have another player in the team, which is Lockheed Martin or SolarSoft. They built the AIA telescope, and their metadata is very similar to what uh, NOAA re uh, reports in this example. But let's look at what Alexis does, right? We find one region, which is exactly where the other teams found it, in space, right? We are there, the other teams are within our integration area, but they're not in, they didn't happen at that specific time, right? We also find another region, completely apart from from where the first flare happened. And with the linear combination of that, we're able to recreate the XRS flux um, fairly well, right? So this calls into question the solar flare phases. Are they real? Do we have to revisit them, right? Um, what people would call a gradual part in this phase, in this example, it's actually another flare. Right, let's look at another example, which is synchronous flares. It's the first observational evidence of synchronous flares. Two active regions exploding at the same time, right? Um, we see here, where Space Weather Prediction Center detected uh, the flare, we see where Lockheed Martin detected the flare and our three integration regions. You also see the flare duration, but you can see that the linear combination of two regions actually reproduces the X-ray flux. So can we constrain, can we map from the EUV to what the X-ray flux should be? We're overestimating it here, right? Well, that is a question that Alexis is poised to answer. Another, but we're not perfect, right? Here's an example in which we miss a flare, and we miss this side over here, right? There are various reasons for, for why the pipeline fails. One of the reasons is we need more data, right? If we had more data, maybe 30 more minutes over to the left, then we could recreate that peak, but we still find it. We still find the region, we just can't identify the peak, right? So let's look at um, the results. So I am reporting over 1,000 results. Uh, over a thousand solar flares, and the Alexis catalog is able to increase the solar flare catalog for this sample by 12%. We also identify a lot more M and X class flares, which are the ones that are important for um, life on Earth, um, bases on the moon. 
but we also see that other teams uh, either incorrectly label the location or the timing of the solar flare. And also, Alexis misses about 4% of, the, of, the, of this catalog that we set out to find. Now, remember the differential technique that I was showing you earlier that we talked about at the beginning? This is the results of me taking that differential technique, those peaks times that the derivative returned, and comparing it to the peak times of other people of other teams. Now, this isn't a result per se. There's a lot of false positives here. But nevertheless, it's motivation to keep on working. Right now, we could, we, I just reported on 1,000 random samples from here. But we're currently working on a, more than 8,000 samples at Argonne National Labs using more than 100 terabytes of image data and ten, tens of thousands of node hours. Finally, this Alexis data product will be returned to the public where all the metadata necessary to produce all the plots that you have seen here will be given to the public. Right, And this is um, a Correct solar census of solar flares um, has a great impact for many, uh, for many different type of uh, atmospheric research, solar research, um, and for upcoming moon missions. I'll leave some here. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, Kelly Holly Bockelman, which is my advisor, Eric Jonas, who I worked with at the University of Chicago for the past three years, and Christopher Moore. Um, thank you for your time. Obviously, the more powerful flares are very rare, but the, if it would have happened today, it would have cost trillions of dollars to the infrastructure we have. So that's on a time scale of, let's say, centuries. Mm -hmm. On a time scale of decades, how expensive would be the damage? I mean, uh, can you give us an example? I, off the top of my head, I can give you a number, but it would be catastrophic, right? We're talking about power grids are off. You have these charged particles coming in. They gyrate through all our, our electric systems. Transformers blown. You would have to rebuild all of this. Um, so, so what can we do? Like if, you, if someone gives an alert, what can we do? So that's tricky, right? Because mm -hmm. how, how, how confident are we on the alert? Is it better to predict a big flare and it not happening? Or is it better to predict um, that a flare is not going to happen and then something does happen, right? Um, so. I forgot the question. So, is there anyone in Washington DC worried about it? Or um, so, people are worried about it, but also everybody's in their own lives, right? So, <laughs> um, people think that this is a rare event. They take it, it is a rare event, but it's, it's bound to happen at some point. Their, their time scale is four years, so they say, let's say you get a problem with the next administration. Yeah, basically. You can um, show them that over four years that could be damaged, but I guess that doesn't happen. No. Um, <laughs> And it's also, it's also important to know what is our main goal, right? If the main goal is to predict solar flares, can we identify which regions are getting really bright? Is that enough? Or do we need a model to actually predict yes or no, right? So we have to have in play the technology that we, have to, that we want in place versus actually answering the question. Other comments, please? Right, good question, comment, great talk, go ahead. Thank you. Now it may not be as pertinent to hear us here on Earth, but what about astronauts as they're navigating? So this is super important um, for astronauts, both, all right, so let's go from Earth all the way up, right? Once we're going up, the density increases. If there's, high, uh, if there's a high activity, density increases. This actually happened to, to um, SpaceX a couple of years back, where they lost a bunch of satellites. Um, now, energetic particles uh, for astronauts is completely, it's, it's, it's horrible, right? You could, you could cause uh, mutations, um, you could cause damage to their, to their uh, safety in terms of their infrastructure. Um, is there an example of someone that suffered this? Off the top of my head, no. I cannot, I cannot give you an example other than uh, the, about, I don't know, 1987, 1989, the Quebec grid, the, so this is not a person, right, but the Quebec grid, their waterways kind of went down with one of these events. Uh, energetic particles came and they shut down uh, uh, their, their water processing plants. Um, but now we're, we're so dependent on technology that anything that really happens on, on in fact, I actually read today, um, so I don't know how many of you had problems with your cell phone coverage this morning. Um, there, were, there were articles that came out that, that it could have been a solar flare. It wasn't a solar flare, right? They, were, they compared it to one that, to a, solar, a big solar flare event that happened yesterday, but it would take a couple of days for those charged particles to actually interact. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I, this is fairly important, and it's also fairly worrying that 
the data products that we do use need a lot more curation, right? Um, and so that is why I think this project is important. There's a bunch of other ways uh, that other projects that stem out of it that I'm interested in, in pursuing. Um, so I'm looking for a postdoc. Um, but, uh, but nevertheless, a, an, another part of it is the scale of the data, right? We have 25 petabytes of data for SDO. It's hard to analyze 25 petabytes of data. Right now, I'm taking chunks at it at 100 terabytes. I want to then multiply it by 10 and do it later with a, with a bigger data set. But nevertheless, we have so much information, but we don't have the tools and techniques to be able to exploit that information. So I think that is very important. About six years ago, I, I visited the uh, observatory in Mount Haleakala. That's uh, the solar observatory, Inayu, uh, the Inayu Observatory. And uh, they, they were basically saying, I mean, their main facility is to cool the telescope because it gets so much heat from the sun when it's looking at the sun during the day. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were complaining that they don't get enough data from the sun because they want to see each and every turbulent eddy Mm -hmm. And it just shows that astronomers are never satisfied. If you look at the sun <laughs> and you don't have enough data. Yeah. yeah. And, and we're finally in that big, big data era. We have about 15 years worth of data. Really good, high cadence, high resolution data, right? Um, we have the statistical know-hows and the tools to be able to kind of implement this. We just need the training and we need to be able to dedicate time, resources, to be able to answer these sites of questions. It's still not <laughs> Not enough, yeah. Let's thank Jorge. It's great to be back here as always, uh, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the work I've been doing recently over the past year. I'm Viran Chandra. I'm a third year graduate student in this department, and I've been working with some ITC members, including Lars Hernquist, Vadim Semenov, and Gus Bean, uh, to try and build a story uh, for our Milky Way. So as always, let's start right at the beginning. It's generally accepted that we live in a galaxy called the Milky Way. And a lot of astronomers have spent a lot of time understanding the present day properties of the Milky Way. It's a disk galaxy. It has some spiral arms, some of which were discovered from the roof of this building right here. Uh, and it seems to have these kind of thin and thick disks that differ in their kinematics, their structure, and their chemistry. Uh, at the same time, astronomers have spent decades building these intricate theories of galaxy formation, right? These rich stories of gas accretion and mergers and hierarchical assembly and galaxies eating other galaxies until they look the way that they do today, like this beautiful picture here shows. And so to me, it's a really interesting area of research to see how we can join these two aspects together and use the present day observations of the Milky Way to ask, what could the story of our Milky Way have looked like? How do we kind of get these pieces of galaxy formation theory out of our own galaxy and answer basic questions about what did the Milky Way look like way back in the past? Why does it have a disk, and why does the disk look the way that it does? And so that's the kind of work that we do in our group. And over the past decades, there's been a lot of progress in this field. One of the most revolutionary aspects of this was the Gaia Space Observatory, which I'm sure you're all tired of hearing about. But in particular, Gaia released last year low-resolution spectroscopy for over 200 million stars. And for about 20 million red giants, it also released radial velocities. And so these are coming from this one space observatory that's scanning the entire sky. And so what you have is this data set of about 20 million red giants spanning half the spatial extent of the Milky Way's disk. That's our actual sample up there. And these stars have full 6D motions. You know where they are, you know how they're moving, you know what their orbits are, and you know something about their chemical composition, which gives you clues about when they were formed. And so this really is the gold standard data set to try and answer those questions that I laid out about what the story of our Milky Way might have been like. And so the way we approach that is with this one plot here. It's probably one of my favorite plots that I've made so far. And what you're seeing here is for that sample, on the x-axis, that's stellar metallicity, which, like I mentioned, is a rough proxy for cosmic time, cosmic time increasing towards the right. 
And what you see in this color map on the y-axis is at each metallicity, four stars at each given metallicity, what is the distribution of their orbits? And that's encoded in this parameter called the orbital circularity. So it's a single number that encodes high up there for positive values. You have very circular, very ordered prograde orbits. At the bottom, you have exactly the opposite, ordered retrograde orbits going counter to the way most of the Milky Way is moving. And in the center is where you'll have orbits that are very disordered and isotropic. They could be radial, they could be eccentric, they could be moving in all kinds of directions. And immediately when you look at this, what I call portrait of the orbital evolution of the Milky Way, you see this very clear three-phase structure where the most metal poor stars, the most ancient stars, are very isotropic. They're not disky at all. They're very disordered. And in fact, we find that most of them are actually concentrated in the center of the Milky Way. So this is what we'd call the proto-Milky Way, the proto-galaxy, the Milky Way that existed before it had a disk. With this Gaia data, we can now see it in its entirety, and we can see its orbital structure. Mixed in there, of course, are also stars from what we consider the Milky Way halo, so stars that were deposited from mergers by other galaxies. However, as you see, there's a very clear transition at a characteristic metallicity that's called spin-up, where all of a sudden you see the emergence of this disky component that's still a little bit disordered, but overall pretty disky. And moving forward in time, there's this other apparent transition of cooldown, where you now have stars at those metallicities being very coherent on these extremely thin, thin disk orbits. And so this is kind of your rough snapshot, your observational snapshot of the Milky Way's orbital evolution. But of course, uh, the picture is much more complicated. As many of you know, stellar metallicity is not exactly equal to cosmic time. That relationship is neither linear nor, mo nor monotonic. It's a little bit more complicated than that. And so we need to do a little bit more work to understand what exactly this diagram is telling us about our galaxy's history. And the way we do that is by moving to simulations. And so in particular, the illustrious TNG simulations are these beautiful full hydrodynamical simulations in a cosmological volume where what we can do is we can ask where are the galaxies that look like the Milky Way structurally, that have similar masses, similar sizes, they're disk galaxies. Once we have those galaxies in the simulation, what does this diagram look like for those galaxies? What is their orbital evolution going to look like? And it turns out there's a lot of diversity. So for disk galaxies that, to first glance, look like the Milky Way, there's actually a wide range of behaviors in this plane. What I'm showing you here is actually a subset that look pretty similar to the Milky Way. But believe me, there's a lot of variation, and some look quite different. However, even among this subset that look a lot like the Milky Way, where you have this proto-galaxy and then a spin-up, you'll see that there's still a little bit of variation. And in particular, there's one galaxy that seems to look a lot like the Milky Way, more so than any of the others that we considered. We looked at about 61 Milky Way-like galaxies, and that one really stood out, because as you can see, it's got this very clear kind of three-phase behavior that we also see in the Milky Way. And so when I sent this uh, plot to Vadim, my close collaborator on this, he was very happy. He concluded that we do, in fact, live in that galaxy, and our job is done. Uh, it's not quite so nice as that. But what this does give us, of course, is now that we have this galaxy, because it lives in simulation land, we can turn the clock back and ask, what did that galaxy go through? What was the history of that galaxy? And why does it look the way it does on this diagram? Does that give us some clues to what happened to the Milky Way? And so you can do something like this, where you're seeing from left to right snapshots of that galaxy. On the top, you have that kind of orbital portrait of the galaxy's evolution. And then you have the distribution of stars and the distribution of gas in a fixed coordinate frame. And so I'll let you just soak in these snapshots, because they look pretty. Uh, but then I'll lay on some story time. right? And here's where we can now try and understand uh, why this galaxy's orbital evolution plot looks the way it does. Right? At very early times, this galaxy assembles a tiny little proto-galaxy that is confined to the center of the galaxy, just like we see now in the Milky Way. And pretty early on, actually, the galaxy manages to assemble a pretty early disk. And that disk is actually remarkably coherent. As you can see up there, uh, that early disk is quite thin, but it's misaligned. It's almost 90 degrees out of the plane of what the present-day disk ends up being. After that, this galaxy undergoes the most decisive event in its history. And that's a very major gas-rich merger about seven to eight billion years ago. You can actually see it over there in that central snapshot hitting the disk. 
And this merger is very influential. It starts to tilt that old disk down. In the process, it heats those orbits, and so that early kind of very coherent disk is perturbed and becomes more thickened. And there's also a lot of gas accretion that comes in subsequent to this merger that seeds the formation of a subsequent young kinematically thin disk at the present day. And so that rough storyline for this galaxy is what produces that three-phase behavior uh, on that plot. It's a little bit more complicated than that plot would lead you to believe, but you still end up with that same structure that we observe. And so in summary, what we've found here is a plausible story, not the plausible story, for what this movie might have looked like for the Milky Way, given its orbital structure. And one reason to conclude that we particularly favor this story is we actually have ample evidence from the halo of the Milky Way that it did undergo a very major merger about 10 billion years ago. That merger actually makes up the bulk of the stars that we see in the stellar halo. And what we argue in this work is that perhaps that merger played a very decisive role in transforming the disks of the Milky Way as well. And so I think finally we're getting some clues towards those big questions I laid out about why the Milky Way disk spun up in the first place. Vadim Semenov also has some fantastic work on that. And also this question of why we see this transition between the thick and thin disks. Why are they chemically distinct? Why are they kinematically distinct? We seem to be arguing here that perhaps this merger played a major role there. And Angus Bean has been working a lot on running idealized simulations to dig into that question a little bit more. And so there's a lot of work yet to be done. Uh, but this was a lot of fun to work on. So if you're interested, please read the paper here. And I'd love to take people's questions. Thank you. Are we? How unique is the Milky Way? Can you say like which percentage of the population do we belong to, or how unusual it is? Yeah, that's a great point. So this is work. Uh, this is something that Vadim looked into in a paper that we worked on together at the start of last year which is uh, when people started discovering this spin up in the Milky Way, there was this concern that the Milky Way seems to spin up earlier at lower metallicities than what some simulations would lead you to believe. But then Vadim looked in TNG 50 and it turns out that although it is not the average time at which Milky Way mass galaxies spin up, uh, the Milky Way is in this kind of 10th percentile of early spin up galaxies. And so at least in the time of spin up, the Milky Way seems to be in that percentile. Uh, the implication is that perhaps the Milky Way underwent unusually rapid mass assembly at the early times. That's something I've been working on as well, to see was that actually true. We can see those stars that are in that very early Milky Way. Are they actually unusually massive as a population? Uh, that'll be another way to kind of get a handle on that. Thank you. Good question. So please, yeah. uh, Does that halo get a reasonable bulge fraction for the Milky Way? And if so, uh, can you say anything about how much of the bulge came from that merger versus secular uh, evolution later on? Yeah, I don't know if you're the referee for this paper, but our referee asked us that exact same question. Um, and I haven't quite gotten to answering it. Uh, the truth is that the, this, halo, this halo does end up forming like a bar, and it does have a, like, a pretty appreciable like, boss population, but I haven't looked into that in too much detail. That's a great question. Yeah, okay. yeah similarly, um, is, you spoke to the idea that the Milky Way might have undergone like, unusually rapid like mass accretion, would the merger have contributed to that? Yeah, so it's two different aspects of that. One aspect is definitely the merger, where the merger in this case is like a two to one merger, which is similar to what we expect at that time, which is similar to what we expect for the Milky Way's data. Uh, but when I was talking about the early mass assembly, that's even earlier, which is when you have the spin up of the disk in the first place. Uh, what Vadim's paper finds is that that is promoted by uh, even earlier mass buildup. And so the merger could happen like 10 giga years in the past, 9 giga years in the past. The unusually rapid mass buildup is like 11 uh, billion years or 12 billion years when the first disk starts to spin up. Yeah. Of course, it's all connected, right? Like if your halo is in an unusually like dense region of space, you're going to be hit more early and hit more late. Yeah. And the sun formed 4.6 billion years ago, so it had nothing to do with that merger. As far as we know, it had nothing to do with that merger, exactly. <laughs> Uh, so you showed five examples from your sample, and one of them having the distinct three phases. Were there any other uh, members in your in your sample that had three phases but did not experience the merger? Was there basically the contrary? That's a great question. Uh, so there were none of the other ones in our sample that showed the three phases that clearly. 
Uh, however, there were a lot of other ones that did undergo major mergers like the ones that we see. But in those cases, the diagram would look very different in some cases. In some cases, the merger would completely destroy the early disk. In some cases, it would prevent like a nice disk from being formed in the first place. And so there clearly seems to be like some hints there that it's not enough to just have a major merger, but it has to do certain things. Like maybe its angular momentum has to be in a particular direction so as to not fully destroy the early disk. Maybe it has to bring in a lot of gas to seed the new disk. So there's all those kind of like causal clues that um, we kind of hint at at the paper, but it needs a little bit more work to establish. Yeah. Okay, um, that's the question. Oh, yeah. So yeah. Um, what, another piece of the story that's really important are the alpha abundances, not just the metallicity, but alpha. Yeah. What's the potential for including that on the observational side, but then also the simulation side from tracking alpha? Yeah, so I didn't go into this at all, but in this paper, we do look a little bit into the alpha, and uh, there's this whole question of, you know, why does the thin disk have alpha? This infall of fresh gas from the merger is actually a very natural way to reset the metallicity of that disk. And so we see that to some extent in this halo that I showed you. We see that to a much larger extent in other halos. And that's ongoing work I'm doing with both Vadim and Gus, is in TNG50, do you have these mergers contributing to this alpha bimodality? And it seems that at least in some galaxies, you do see that. Thank you. It's always uh, a pleasure uh, to, visit, uh, to visit this institute. Today we'd like to tell you about uh, a new way of uh, probing dark matter. And you may know that we are undergoing a phase of profound transformation in the field of uh, dark matter studies, which is due to the absence of evidence uh, for the most promising candidates like WIMPs and axions, all particles you probably heard about, which we've never found in our experiments. I'll I stress that we have absence of evidence. We don't have evidence of absence for any of these candidates so far. So it's important to keep searching if, wherever we can. But it's also important to think differently and to start thinking about uh, other ways to test uh, uh, the existence of dark matter and to try and identify the nature of dark matter. And in this presentation, I want to focus on gravitational waves as probes of dark matter. So thanks for the introduction uh, to the field of gravitational waves. And um, so all the, the, I removed all technical material uh, from the slides, uh, but I just wanted to mention that most of the work that I will present was carried out by these uh, wonderful people uh, in, um, in Amsterdam. And I'll try to add some references for those of you who want to follow up and know more. Now, I want to, since we are here, I wanted to start with uh, uh, something we are all familiar with, uh, which is black holes. Now, in general relativity, black holes, you know, we studied this in kindergarten, you know, they're completely described by uh, these three parameters, mass, angular momentum, and charge. But as we all know, uh, the observed distribution of mass, angular momentum, charge, and, and redshift is drawn from a probability distribution they carry information about the history of the, the formation history of these, uh, of these objects. And in particular, these objects do not exist in vacuum. These objects have an environment uh, surrounding them. The environment enables electromagnetic detection. We see these, you know, we can produce images like that uh, because we have gas around these objects. Uh, we have uh, dynamical measurements of their mass because the stars around them. Uh, these uh, environments also affect the probability for drawing the, the, from this, this distribution of masses, angular momentum, uh, charge, and, and redshift. The very fact that Q equals zero in the system we consider is because there's, a, there's plasma around these, uh, these objects, neutralizing the charge, and it can influence the formation scenario. Black holes wear environment before being black holes. And then I want to focus on, on the third point, which is that the presence of these environments can alter the gravitational waveforms. Now, the kind of environments I have in mind, uh, and uh, the ones that we've uh, worked out in, in some detail, are the familiar accretion disks. I will tell you a little bit about these dark matter spikes, these over-densities of dark matter, 
around black holes. And I will mention also something that is attracting a lot of attention in the theory community, which is this, uh, the, the case of gravitational atoms. Now, why do we expect over densities of dark matter around black holes? Now, the standard example how you gr can grow an over density is by saying black holes, like the supermassive black hole at the center of our own galaxy, they sit at the center of very large concentrations of dark matter. You know, think the halo of the dark matter halo of the Milky Way. Black holes are pro most probably not formed already with their final mass that we observe today. They form a seed, an initial seed. We don't know what the, in, the mass of the initial seed actually is. Can be the remnant of a population three star, can be a more massive object in, in the case of these direct collapse uh, scenarios uh, for the formation of, of black holes. But if you do the very simple exercise of studying how a distribution of dark matter would react to the growth, the, the growth of a black hole from an initial mass to its final mass, you can actually you know, just uh, uh, do conservation of mass and angular momentum and find that if you have, if you have an, init an initial power law distribution of dark matter, you conserve mass and angular momentum due to these, see, if, it is, if this is an adi adiabatic process, uh, you can uh, basically figure out uh, what is the final distribution of dark matter. It will respond to this increased gravitational potential and grow what is called a spike of dark matter with a steeper power law index. If you plug in gamma equal one, as you would do for an NFW profile, you get a spike uh, power law index, which is seven over three. So a pretty, pretty steep distribution of dark matter around black holes. Another environment I wanted to briefly mention, I won't have time to discuss this in any detail, but this is something which has uh, been studied for many decades now uh, in physics. The idea is if you have particles that have a quantum wavelength which is comparable to the size of black holes, of spinning black holes, you can grow over densities of these boson condensates around the black hole, you can extract the mass and angular momentum of the black hole and form these what are called gravitational atoms. This is really in analogy with uh, the electron orbitals. In fact, you write down uh, what looks like a Schrodinger equation for the, uh, for the density of these uh, orbitals around supermassive black holes. Okay, so the particular uh, observable uh, that we studied or one of the observables we studied, this is the one we studied most in, in, in greater uh, detail, is the following. We have a central object, a central black hole, which is surrounded by a distribution of dark matter. Okay, we have a secondary object, M2, with a much smaller mass, so, the, so this is an extreme mass ratio in spiral or an intermediate mass ratio in spiral. And what we want to, to do is to ask the question, how would the presence of dark matter perturb the dynamics of the system and what would be the signature of this perturbation on the waveform that you can calculate? And, this is, and then we will ask the question, can we observe this dephasing with an experiment like LISA? Now, you can actually do this, uh, this exercise. You can work out what are the energy losses induced by dynamical friction in the case of this overdensity of dark matter so this is the, the line corresponding to dark matter spike here, and these energy losses are normalized to the energy losses by gravitational waves, which are well understood, as a function of the distance from the central object. So we have dark matter spikes, we have gravitational atoms, and you see the characteristic imprint of the quantum structure of the, of the uh, gravitational atom that leads to discontinuities in these uh, energy losses. And in the case of accretion disks, uh, you can calculate what is the, uh, the energy losses mainly induced by torques in that particular case. Okay, now what you want to do, and I'll show you like a pictorial version of it. Uh, this is the strain, the, the waveform that you calculate for GR in vacuum. Let's place this uh, binary, this extreme mass ratio spiral in an environment. And what you will see is that the effect is very small, but it's a cumulative effect that induces a dephasing in the waveform uh, of, these, uh, of these systems. Now, this is the pictorial version. You can actually do the actual calculation. You can calculate the energy losses. 
gravitational wave plus dynamical friction in the case of dark matter. There is one there's only one technical point I want to make here, which is the following. When you write down the, the equation that regulates the evolution of the separation between these two objects, usually you have one term that describes the energy losses by gravitational waves. In this case, you have the, to add this second term. And the reason why adding the second term is difficult is that there is here, you see that it, this uh, dynamical friction depends on the density of dark matter. But the density of dark matter is a time dependent quantity. And the reason for that is that when you have the secondary object that is steering the dark matter distribution, the dark matter distribution will react to these, uh, uh, to these steering effects. So you have to co-evolve the binary and the phase space distribution from which you calculate the density of dark matter. It's uh, a bit complicated, a bit involved uh, to, to do the full calculation, but now we have a number of articles. Two of these articles actually appeared, one yesterday and one today, on the archive, where we solved this problem and we are quite confident because we also have numerical simulations uh, backing up uh, these results. We're quite confident that we are on the right track. Now, let me uh, wrap up um, by asking one fundamental question. So we have two fundamental questions, actually. The first one is, if these waveforms are defaced, would we be able to detect this defacing with an experiment like LISA? And the answer is yes. These waveforms do look different with respect uh, to GR in vacuum. And, the other, and actually, if you're interested, all the details are in this, in this paper here, but I'd be happy to answer any question you may have on that. But let me also make this additional point that not only you can tell that this is not GR in vacuum, you can tell which one of these different environments, accretion disks, uh, dark matter spikes, or gravitational atoms, is causing the defacing, and I don't expect you to digest uh, in one minute all of these uh, posteriors, but this is just to say you can reconstruct the parameters of the system, the parameters describing the distribution of dark matter or the parameters of the gravitational atoms and so on, if you measure these effects. So take home messages, gravitational waves are very powerful probes of black hole environments. We're going in the, in the direction of doing precision gravitational wave astronomy. Different environments lead to different signatures and dark matter leaves a characteristic signature on the gravitational waveform. So this opens up the possibility to identify the dark matter nature with gravitational waves. Thank you. Yes, we did. Let me reopen the mic. Yes, we did uh, do the calculation. For a long time, we thought that the effect would be completely negligible, but now we have uh, actually performed uh, the calculation. And in these two papers that appeared, the ones that I mentioned appeared yesterday and today, we have a very careful estimate of the accretion of mass and momentum actually on the compound object. And actually, we've demonstrated that this is important early on in the spiral, but then it becomes a subdominant effect as the binary evolves. Comments, questions? Yes, please. Could this transition from NFW to a dark matter spike, could that help feed these black holes to get them above that supermassive threshold? Unfortunately, it's very difficult. Uh, you really need dissipative processes to feed uh, the black hole, which is what you typically do with, uh, with gas. Right. Uh, eating up dark matter is not a, a very efficient diet uh, to gain weight for these, uh, uh, for these monsters. Unless the dark matter is self-interactive. Exactly. Unless you include dissipative effects in the dark, in the dark sector, in that case, yeah, that can help. And some people suggest that. That's right. So it may be a way of testing the nature of dark matter. Yeah. Just naively, how confident are you you can distinguish between these spikes and accretion disks in signal? Yeah, let me see. Accretion disks are, black holes are complicated, right? Yes, no, I agree. Uh, and that's exactly why we've uh, performed uh, this exercise. Um, all right, so let me just uh, uh, plot this. Uh, I don't have, I wanted to show you the Bayes factors. Uh, uh, and this is all described in this paper, and I'll be happy to show them to you later on. But we've asked, we, we built a full Bayesian pipeline and we performed Bayesian model comparison. And we asked the question, suppose you inject a waveform which is generated assuming that there's an accretion disk 
right? You inject it in, uh, uh, in, um, uh, in LISA data, and then you just forget about how you generated the data, and you try to reconstruct or to identify the environment uh, by, by means of uh, Bayesian model comparison. You just build a, uh, compute the Bayes factor for different models, and the Bayes factors are overwhelmingly in favor of the right model for each of these three environments. So we are very, very confident. There is though something that you know, must be said whenever we make these statements. So far, we're working uh, in a sort of a simplified um, setup for these embryos. Black holes are Schwarzschild. You know, there, there are no spins in, these, uh, in the system. And there might be some subtleties connected to the computation of relativistic waveforms. They might use some you know, complicated systematics. They might deserve to be, uh, to be un better understood. But the point is, once you have an environment, you can really describe how frequency evolves with time in all these, in all these systems. And that evolution with frequency is really characteristic of a particular environment. Okay. Oh, last question. Okay. Great talk. Uh, what is the mass of the binary two mass? And how far in size does, can we succeed at this distance? Uh, say again, sorry, the mass of uh, the, the, the two masses of the system. And then the distance to which we can have the SNR and these such. I, I have some numbers in, in the paper, but if I remember correctly, you can see these things out to kind of 100 megaparsecs, something, something like that. There are uncertainties on the number of expected systems of this type, uh, you know, extreme mass ratio in spirals or intermediate mass ratio in spirals. Uh, and we are trying actually to, this is the next step. This is part of the uh, work in progress that we are, that we are currently doing um, to do population studies and trying to estimate how many of these systems you form and how many would be detectable with, uh, with LISA. But if, if they are within the LISA range, we should be able to tell whether they live in an environment or not. You have 10 years to finish the calculation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you.